Are you ready? Good. Work with me today. We are starting a new homily series for Advent, Father Declan and I. But it's a little bit different from our normal homily series where we pick a topic and we try to develop it. What we're going to do is every week we're going to listen to the readings and we're going to pull out a biblical character. We're going to give you some information about that individual and try to look through that person's eyes. Okay? All right. So today, we're going to try to look through the eyes of Noah. Now, the story of Noah and the ark is one of the most popular Bible stories of all time, right? I mean, especially for little kids because you got all those little animals, put them in the ship, you know. It's really cool. But today, we're going to try to move past our childlike understanding and try to move towards a more adult-like understanding of who Noah was and what his message speaks to us today. Again, we always got to set the context. So we're introduced to Noah in chapter 6 of Genesis. And what's happened so far is Adam and Eve have faced the consequence of their sin and were sent out of the Garden of Eden where they had to toil to survive. They experienced pain, which they never did before, suffering, fear, anxiety, and ultimately death. All consequence for their sin. Now the next significant thing we hear about them is when their two sons, Cain and Abel, make sacrifice to God. Their form of worship. And a few weeks ago we talked about that, right? Remember? Well, if you don't, you just say no. But we did talk about it. So let me recap a little bit. Abel, a shepherd, brings the very best that he has. The, the spotless, perfect lamb, and he offers it for sacrifice. Again, that's how they worship God. Cain, on the other hand, a farmer, brings the refuge of his garden, what's left over, and he offers that to God. God rejects Cain's offering, but he accepts Abel's. And instead of taking this act of, as an act of discipline to correct his behavior, Cain becomes resentful, prideful. He becomes angry. And he focuses all that on his brother with great jealousy. And ultimately, it leads to violence and he kills his brother. As a result of that, God exiles Cain. But Scripture tells us that the Lord put a mark on him so that in no way would his life be in danger. Even after sin, God's mercy has no limits. And Adam and Eve have another son, Seth. And Seth picks up the righteousness and devotion of his late brother Abel. And so both Cain... And Seth, they create generations of peoples, nations, if you will. Now, Seth's people continue to worship and honor God in righteousness. That is, putting the will of God before their own desires and their own preferences. Cain's people are very industrious, and they prosper in science and in art, but they live for themselves. They live for themselves, creating great wealth and great poverty, a disparity within their culture. Cain's descendants are given into greed, selfishness, and violence. And most importantly, they do not give God the respect or worship that he deserves. Genesis categorized these two peoples as describing Cain's descendants as the daughters of men, while Seth's descendants are described as the sons of God. Now, Genesis 6 describes how over the generations, the sons of God began to marry the daughters of men, and their wicked ways became part of the men of God's ways. 
and over generations, the pressure to compromise, the pressure to make exceptions, the pressure not to remain as faithful as they once were begins to erode this culture. You know, we're too busy. We can't go to temple this week. Okay, why are you wearing that in modest clothes? Well, everybody else is wearing these things. Why can't I wear these things? And on and on and on. Until eventually, until eventually what happens is that culture of death, that culture of immorality, that culture of darkness begins to completely take over the culture of light. And Seth's people have succumbed by typically minutia over a time period eroding what they had. They no longer worship God the way they should. So, in chapter 6, God decides to wipe out the human race along with every other living creature. He is so thoroughly disgusted with what the human race has become that he wants to tear down everything he created and start all over. This divine disgust falls on everyone but a little farmer named Noah. Noah, you see, has kept the faith. He's the only person on the planet that has kept the faith of his great, great, great grandfather, Seth. And scripture tells us in Genesis 6, verse 8, that, quote, Noah found favor with God. Now, before I continue, let me make a point that's really important here. When we talk about these biblical characters that are seen as type of heroes for us, we need to understand that they weren't always perfect people. The power of their stories is because they weren't perfect people. The power of their lives is because they reflect our lives. Now, in many ways, there are people just like you and me. They made mistakes. They lost their patience. They often dropped the ball, missed the mark, just like we do. But what made them special, what made them memorable, was they always held on to the faith. Why they became important and inspiring for us is they lived with many difficulties just like we do. Often in societies that rejected their values like we do. Mocked and criticized for the expression of our faith too often like us. Yet they stood strong. They did not bend. They did not compromise with evil. They kept God in front and center of their lives and they understood that their blessings the giftedness of their lives, their very lives itself, depended on God, not their actions. Noah is such a man, such a biblical hero, not because of his averageness, or not just because of that, but because, like you and I, in face of many difficulties, he never let go of his faith. In Hebrews 11, verse 7, we read, By faith, Noah warned about what was not yet seen with reverence built an ark for the salvation of his household. Noah is an Old Testament figure given to the New Testament people to teach us how to live by faith. If you go back to Genesis 6 verse 9, we learn a little bit more about Noah Genesis tells us Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. He walked with God. Now, Noah was a righteous man because he lived to please God. Noah was a blameless man because he had integrity with the people around him. And the reason Noah could be righteous and the reason that he could be so blameless is because of the walk. Because Noah walked with God. He was on the same page that God was on. And trust me, when you walk with God, God's going to walk with you. Amen? Amen? Noah walked with God. Walking with God is pleasing God. Nothing makes God happier than to see a person walking by faith, making their decisions based on their relationship with God bringing God 
to bear on their decision making in terms of things that decisions they're making about their lives. When you live like that, when you live by allowing God to come into your life and help you make your decisions, then God becomes very real to you. I think what makes this even more significant is the context in which Noah walked with God. That context is found in the first eight verses in chapter 6 of Genesis. And this lets us know what it was like for Noah to continue to walk with God when all around him people were living lives that rejected God or at very best paid lip service to God. Let's take a peek. I don't want to read all eight verses. I'm just going to read one verse. Take a peek because I think it summarizes. This is Genesis 6, verse 5. When the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human beings was on earth and how every desire that they had in their heart was always nothing but evil, this next line really saddens me, the Lord regretted making human beings and his heart was grieved. When I look out at our world today and I see the violence of children killing other children, of crazy people going in and shooting up places, when I go and see that people actually advocate to kill a baby as it's being born, when you see the violence and the division and the immorality and the way of life that so many people are living today, how could God not look at us and feel grieved. Amen? You know, when I was a teenager, like a typical teenage boy, I did something that I shouldn't have done. I came home late at night. Lights were off. I thought I'd sneak in the house. I got in the back door, and the light switched on, and there my mother was. And she looked at me, and she said something very simple. She could have screamed and yelled, and I would have, that would have been okay. I expected that. She just looked at me, and she said, I'm so disappointed in you. That wrecked me. And I feel the same way now when I look at the world that we live in. God has to look at us and be grieved. And I feel ashamed to be part of it. Noah lived in a culture that was decaying in immorality, vice, violence, and greed. Sound familiar? Young people, please listen to me. Please listen to me, because you live in a world where every single day you are pounded. You are pounded. You are pounded. You are pounded to use the language of your peers. You're pounded to live the life that your peers live. You are pounded every single day to listen to the music that they listen to, to watch the movies that they watch, to begin to believe what they believe. And you must be strong in your faith. Or sooner or later, that pounding will break you. Parents, especially those of young children, you are pressured all the time as well. How many times have you heard moms and dads, well, so-and-so's mom lets me do this. Yes? It's the whittling away. Sometimes you just get so tired, you just want peace at home. It's not worth the fight. It's little teeny things, but over time it erodes. And the conclusion is there is no faith. You see, Noah was walking with God when no one else was. He was the exception to the rule of the world. He was walking out of step with the culture. And Noah was walking to God's beat and no one else's. Noah was the odd man out. He was the weirdo. He was the religious freak. He was the crazy man because he wasn't conforming to the culture. He wasn't doing it just because everyone else did it. He didn't agree with it just because everybody else agreed with it. He saw himself first and foremost desiring to please God. And he really wasn't caring if he pleased the culture. Now, you've got to appreciate this, and I know some of you do. When you walk with God and not the culture, well, that puts you under a lot of pressure. Some of you know what I'm talking about. 
because that pressure is in your workplaces. You're under pressure to do this act a certain way, to only use certain words, to avoid certain topics, to submit to this, and you're under pressure. You're being squeezed, especially if you're in an environment, educational or corporate or healthcare institutions that are squeezing and putting pressure on you to do and act and think the way they want you to think. If you're trying to walk with God, then I'm going to promise you this. If you're walking with God, then you're going to be the odd man or woman out. You're going to be standing out in that culture, and it's going to be difficult for you because you're going to be under tremendous pressure. You see, it's easy to be a disciple here in these, these octagon walls, right? Yes? Well, basically, we all agree. Basically, we all have the same values. There might be some differences, but basically, we all have the same values. It's easy being a disciple here, but when you go out there, when you go back to your family, when you go back to your workplace, wow then things get tough. When you try to be a Noah in a secular world, you're going to look odd. Not because you're trying to be weird. Not because you want to look odd or appear odd. You know, you're, not because you're trying to look different. It's because if you are walking with God, you are different. That's just a fact. Amen. Noah walked so close to God that he couldn't help but hear God speaking to him. If you're going to hear what God has to say, you have to walk close to him. And when you do, he will speak to you about things that you know you didn't think of. You'll be told things you know were not your ideas. You'll be told to do things even if you don't understand it and you feel compelled still to do it. Woe to the disciple who spends their entire life as a Christian and never hears the voice of God speaking. God says, Noah, the world is corrupt. I'm going to destroy it. So make for yourself and your family an ark. Noah was a farmer. He lived over a hundred miles away from the largest body of water. I mean, he didn't know anything about shipbuilding. He didn't know what he was doing. Some biblical scholars say he didn't even know what rain was because the world was still in this supernatural state. Water came up to feed the plants and never experienced rain. So when, he talked, when God says, I'm going to send a flood, uh, what? What, what, what's, okay. he had no idea, but he walked close to God, and he listened carefully, and the closer and closer he got to God, God told him step by step what to do and how to do it. Scripture tells us he did this for more than a century, about 120 years. He was out there cutting down gopher wood. I mean, you and I, 20 minutes? That'd be enough, right? 120 years, he's building this ark. Now, people all around him, his wife, his sons, his neighbors, tried to talk him out of doing what God was telling them to do. People made him the butt of their jokes. He was openly mocked. He was under great pressure to walk away from God. But he was obedient to his faith. God, uh, I have no idea what or why you're having me build this used boat on dry ground. But, Lord, I don't need to understand. And I certainly don't need to agree. All I need to do is have faith and obey. Genesis 6, verse 22 tells us, Noah complied. He did just as God had commanded him to do. You know what we do? Do you know what we do? 
Thank you. We do what God wants some of the time. If it's easy, okay, we'll do it. If it's convenient, all right, I guess I can do that. But when it gets difficult, when it requires sacrifice, when we're told to go out on a limb and everyone else tells us we're crazy, we back down. We get weak need. We only do it what God wants some of the time. That's because we're not walking with God. Faith is not one foot in and one foot out. Faith is not some of the time. It's all the time. Faith requires a complete obedience to God. It's a hard lesson. Someone after the Mass, the last Mass came up to me and said, Father, this situation, what am I supposed to do? It's so hard. Of course it's hard. God didn't set this out so it could be easy. He didn't set it out so it could be convenient. He didn't set it out so we can, okay, it's no big deal. Anyone can do it. God made it deliberately difficult for only the chosen to do it. Are you one of the chosen? The obedience comes if you're walking with him. But if you're not walking with him, and you're told to obey, then that obedience becomes an irritation. If you're walking with him, then the obedience becomes a natural part, a consequence of the walk. But if you're not walking with him, that obedience, that demand for obedience becomes an irritation to you and you want to shout out, shut up. I'm good enough as I am. Leave me alone. I'm not as bad as the people over there. I'm good enough as I am. You know what 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 tells us? I love that because, you know, I would never know unless I looked it up, right? It says, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Noah, again, he's chopping these gopher wood trees down. For 120 years, he's chopping, he's working all day long because the sun was out so he could see what was going on. But that night, he'd go into town and he would preach. Now, he only had a four-word sermon, It's Going to Rain, I bet you wish at this point I only had a four-word sermon. <laughs> it's going to rain. God told me to tell you it's going to rain. He worked and he witnessed. And his work and his witness was an offense to the common sense of those around him. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes. If you can leave a positive review on a restaurant on Yelp, if you can wear shirts and jackets and caps that announce your favorite ball team, if you can put a bumper sticker on your car and a sign in your yard that tells people who you think they should vote for, why are you an undecided voter when it comes to standing up and professing your faith in Jesus Christ? Why? Noah proclaimed his faith. Let me ask you this question. If at your workplace someone dare accuse you of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Noah was a righteous, honorable man who was not only obedient to his faith, but preached it in word and deed. What about you? What about you? Let the church say,